Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Thank God for yet another opportunity to share God's word. We thank God for this uh, Bible study. And uh, when we think about the word of God, think about how important the word of God is uh, for us in our lives. Um, I'm actually going to do just kind of a follow up of, of Sunday's lesson. You know, uh, the title of Sunday's lesson was Forgive Me, Lord. And the reason why I shared that was because I know in my very own life that there has been times and there still are times that I had questioned uh, God's answer. And the reason why I had questioned God's answer was because it didn't come in the form that I had actually expected it to come in. And this account in Second uh, Kings chapter 5, uh, speaking about Naaman's leprosy being healed, was a, a very good account that we could reference because Naaman already uh, had thought about and already set up in his mind how he had expected uh, to be healed. And and yet, uh, when he got to the man of God, to the prophet Elisha, he did something totally different. And Naaman, uh, first of all, pride rose up in him, and he saw it as, first of all, a level of disrespect to him. And second, it wasn't that uh, fantastic fanfare that he was expecting. So before I go on, I'd like to open in prayer. Father God is in the most precious name of Jesus that we come. We come to say thank you. We come to bless you, to love you, to honor you. We come asking right now that you will prepare hearts and minds to receive what thus said the Lord. We thank you in advance for the impact that your word is going to have in and on our lives. Because in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Again, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Second Kings chapter 5 and uh, Naaman feeling like he knew how that prayer should be answered. And I believe just like for myself, there's times now that I actually, I go to God and ask Lord for forgiveness because I was one of those people. I'm not going to tell you that I have arrived, but I will tell you that I'm more conscious, uh, more aware when I am praying to be open enough to allow the spirit of God to minister to me in such a way that he could bring the answer to me in in the form of a child, maybe my wife, maybe my sons, uh, maybe, you know, grandchildren. Yeah. And so that's how you have to get prepared to receive from the Lord. Going over the recap of, of Second Kings uh, chapter 5, again, the, the, the chapter begins with Naaman being uh, uh, deemed the commander of the army of Syria. And it speaks that he was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. And because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And that's where I want to stop that. In all those different ways that he was described, he was described as a, as a commander of the army. He was described as a as an honorable man, he had it was a man of integrity, a man of character. He was described also as a man of, of of valor, which means that he had courage. And you think about the many battles that he had been in, and yet, uh, you know, he wasn't afraid. He he didn't have fears that relate to going into battle. And so it talks about all these different things. It talked about his character. It says yet, but a leper. So in other words, Naaman had all these different things going for him, being a commander in the army being a mighty man of valor, being a man of honorable, uh, honorable man. However, he had leprosy, which means it was a skin disease, which meant that he was deemed unclean. And so when you think about it from this perspective, all those things he had and yet not had health, that would be like a person having all the money in the world, all the prestige, and not be able to enjoy it because being sick. And here was Naaman, all of this, and, uh, uh, you know, high position in the army, and yet was a leper. As it goes on to say, it talks about, <clears throat> and the Syrians had gone out on rage and had brought back a captive of young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And when we look here, it's talk about how the Syrians had made uh, raid after raid after raid, and this was actually the northern kingdom of Israel at that particular time, and they wind up bringing back uh, this young Jewish girl who now is a slave because she was captured in one of the raids and brought back, and she now waits on Naaman's wife, 
and uh, this young girl who, again, I think about it, she spoke to Naaman's wife about Naaman being able to be with the prophet who was in Samaria, and we're, we're talking about Elisha, uh, and she said that if my master could be with him, then he could be healed of his leprosy. Here's a young girl taking away from her country, taking from the people that she know, taking from the people that uh, that that she had lived with her entire life. And now she's in the country of Syria and she's actually waiting on Naaman's wife. In other words, she uh, cares for Naaman, whatever uh, Naaman's wife desire, that's what she's responsible for doing. However, this young girl has not forgotten God, has not forgotten about the man of God. And so she's sharing with um, her mistress, Naaman's wife, the importance of naming, believing, and trusting that there is indeed a person who is a man of God who is in Samaria who can help him by healing his leprosy. As we go on to read, the scripture talks about it. It says, then Naaman, <coughs> excuse me, and Naaman went in and told his master, meaning the king, thus and thus said the girl, he's from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman my servant to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. First of all, what you've got to understand here is that was the way um, the kings uh, related one to another, uh, sent a letter, in other words, to let the king know that I am the king of Syria, and this is one of my men who I am sending to you. However, the king, not knowing that uh, Naaman should have actually been going to see Elisha, the prophet, the man of God, and he got the letter, and here he is thinking, How, I, I, am I God that I can heal, that I can kill, that I can make alive? Again, not realizing that it should have been um, the man of God who Naaman went to see. And in this particular time, because of so many times that the Syrians had raided the northern kingdom, it made the king suspicious. It made the king believe that uh, he was up to no good. It made the king believe that, okay, he set me up right now to possibly come in and, and maybe raid the land again. However, that was not the desire from this. And so the king, when we look at verse number seven, he says, and it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I a God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks to quarrel with me. In other words, the king was saying, he sent in a letter like this, knowing this is not something that I'm able to do and probably following right up behind this, he's going to probably come in and, and try to take advantage of us and come in and, and maybe try to seize the land or do what, you know, what they've done in, in past times. Verse number eight goes on to read, it says, so it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman <clears throat> became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. And so when you look at this, first of all, it speaks about how uh, Naaman and his entourage, the horses and the chariots, they stood at the door of Elisha's house and it says that the man of God didn't come outside to greet him. And you can look at that in a number of ways. Possibly one that I look at is that uh, Naaman was unclean. And so had the prophet went out and been in his presence, then he would have been deemed unclean and possibly interfered with his ministry. And so he sent a messenger out. However, uh, Naaman was expecting, because of his position, he was expecting 
the man of God, the prophet to come out, the prophet himself. And he say, maybe, and I'm just talking, maybe wave his hand over and, and speak and call on his God. In other words, he was looking for something spe spectacular to happen. And, you know, so people could see the healing, you know, take place right there. And, and people could, could look and, and, and name it again because of, of his arrogance, because he still wasn't all there yet. Now, he, first of all, believed that he could be healed. However, he still was stuck on the way that he would be healed. And he was thinking that that should be under his terms. And so, again, he has to be humbled. And, and now that he has been humbled, he's like, what is this? You know, so the scripture says he became furious. He became angry. And then when we go on, he says, uh, aren't the rivers of uh, uh, Abana and Parpari, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? It says after he thought about the rivers now, you're talking about this old nasty Jordan River. He says, and he went away in a rage. And, and in a rage, when you look at one that's in a rage, you talk about somebody who is just violently uh, angry and, you know, acting in all kind of manner. And so um, he, he just, he was mad and he was furious because the man of God didn't do it the way that he thought it should be done. But again, I would deem or I would call this a humbling uh, experience for for Naaman because here's Naaman saying, uh, okay, once you do it my way and I can get all my stuff together and I can go right on back to uh, to my country. However, that was not the way that the Lord had planned this thing. The way the Lord had planned this thing was for him to have enough faith, to have enough confidence in the word that was given to him through the prophet. And so that's what he had to believe. He had to believe the word of the prophet, not what he thought it should be. Now, he thought he could be healed, but he was not really trusting in the word. He was trusting in the fanfare. He was trusting in something spectacular happening so that he could get his healing. And so as we look at verse number 13, it says, And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? And so when you look at this uh, again, his servant was saying to him, Master, think about it this way. If the prophet, if the man of God had told you to do something spectacular, would you not have done it? Wouldn't you, because you came seeking your healing, if he had told you to do something spectacular, would you not have immediately done it because you were expecting your leprosy to be cleaned? Uh, so what, what's, what's wrong now? He, he told you, he gave you specific instructions on how you could be clean, on how you could be healed, and you got mad. You got angry. And this is what I want to say to you today. You know, sometimes, and myself included, I can think about some times that um, I was expecting God to do things a certain way. And I know for some of us that's uh, listening today, tonight, I should say, you're saying that, yeah, I was mad with God. I was mad with God because of the way God dealt with this particular situation in my life. And I definitely mad with him about how he dealt with this situation in one of my loved one's life. And so when you think about that from this particular perspective, we were just like Naaman. We were angry. We were furious, sometimes um, maybe even in a rage. And I say, is that familiar to you? That reminds you of anybody? And so uh, I'm, I'm sharing this in the manner that I'm sharing right now is because there's been things that people have done to us. There's been things that we've had to endure, which has created um, a level of discomfort in our lives. And we go to God in prayer and we're expecting God to answer that prayer in a particular way. And he chooses to do it his way. And we get mad. We, we get angry. And I think the worst thing that we could do is sometimes when somebody has wronged us, what we're doing when we're praying, we're actually expecting God to uh, uh, 
seek revenge on them, to do something to them, to get even with them. And sometimes what God will do is sometimes God will speak to you and tell you this is what you need to do. And we're still trying to figure out or we're still angry wanting to know, well, why God, why didn't you change her heart? Why didn't you change his heart? Why didn't you change their hearts? And so what you've got to understand is, is the relationship that we have with Almighty God is a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so what we've got to begin to do is we've got to begin to recognize that God is who he says that he is. And if we are who we say that we are, then that means we've got to begin to trust him. We've got to recognize that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And the one thing that I want you to understand is, is we keep on saying, is that you, Lord? At some point in time, we need to stop saying, is that you, Lord? And begin to be obedient to the fact that it is him. Um, you say, well, how do I do that? You do that by becoming more sensitive to the word of God. You do that by reading the word of God. You do that by praying to God. You do that by communicating with God on a regular basis. I'll ask you a question. Let's say in your home, on a job, your, maybe your best friend. Let's, let's go with maybe your best friend. You know your best friend because you communicate with that particular person. And that's how you get to know them is through the relationship that you have. Maybe you go out to dinner with them, you know, uh, you talk on the telephone, you know, different ways that you have found to communicate with that person. This is how we become closer to God as well as we begin to communicate with Almighty God. Our prayer time. You know, a lot of times I think for us, the only time that we actually communicate with God is if when we take the time to to maybe kneel down and pray or sit down and pray or whatever that particular time may be, you know, maybe getting up in the morning or, or, or maybe before we go to bed at night, we say, have you said your prayers? But how about throughout the course of the day, just sometimes talking to God? You know, I, I look at it like this. There's times when certain things are going on, like, Lord, I'm, I'm trusting you. Lord, show me. Uh, Lord, help me in this particular situation. It, you can't wait until you get into... A, a situation and then now you want to talk to God what happens in, in that particular type of situation is you have not developed a, a relationship and so sometimes when God is speaking back you don't quite understand or or you don't want to receive what he's saying because the relationship is not where it needs to be however if you begin to develop a relationship a personal intimate relationship with Almighty God. And, and you know, throughout the course, course of the day, you're talking to God. Lord, uh, you, you indeed are the deliverer. Lord, you're the healer. Lord, you're my protector. You, you see what I'm saying? And those different things, because, and I, I guarantee you this, as you're speaking to God in, in that way, God will speak to your spirit. And so throughout the day, throughout the course of the day, you're talking to God and God in turn is talking back to you. And that's where we really need to get to. We need to get to that point to where we have that type of relationship. And then we won't be like uh, uh, Naaman was. We won't say, well, I expected you to answer this way. I expected you to answer that way. You know, when we look at scripture and the book of Second Corinthians, and it speaks about Paul, it says Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And and some people will tell you that it's this type of sickness. Some people will tell you eyesight. Some people will tell you this. Some people will tell you that. I don't know exactly what it was. So I can't tell you for certain what it was. The only thing that I can tell you is the scripture says that Paul went to the Lord three times to ask the Lord to remove uh, those particular infirmities, those particular things that, that had him troubled, those thorns that was in his flesh. Yet the Lord did not remove those. Now, who in the Bible had, I mean, a better relationship than what Paul had with Almighty God? I mean, Paul was a man that when Paul prayed, things happened. When Paul prayed, people got healed. When Paul prayed, people were delivered. When Paul prayed, people were set free. The blind were given sight. You, you understand what I'm saying? So Paul had a, a relationship with Almighty God. However, during this particular time when Paul had asked, <clears throat> excuse me, that the thorn be removed from his flesh, the answer that he got from God was that my grace 
is sufficient. In other words, what God was saying is, is even in spite of what you're going through, in spite of what's going on in your life, my grace is sufficient. In other words, what God was saying is, Paul, in spite of what's going on there, I've given you the strength. I've given you the power to endure. I've given you the power in spite of all that's going on in your life to continue to strive and do what I've called you to do. Why did I go there? I went there because there's times that uh, even Paul was expecting man, that thing to be done, just, just done and, and over with. But God had other plans. And there's times even in our lives that God is doing something. You know, people will tell you that you're sick because you did something wrong. People will tell you that you're in a particular situation because you did something wrong. You know, sometimes certain things happen in our lives because God can use us as a testimony. There's times, and I'll give you an example in, 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 the, in the scriptures. The scripture speaks about how there was a young boy who was blind uh, from birth. And um, the uh, apostles asked the question, who sinned, his mother or his dad? And, and Jesus said that not one of them sinned. It was not a sin that caused the sickness that caused the blindness, but it was so that God could get the glory out of that young man's life. And what happened is Jesus was able to heal him. And so what I'm saying to you is there's times that God will use certain things in our lives so that not only are we going to be blessed by it, but others can be blessed by it. And you say, well, I really don't want that. I don't know about that. However, if you think about it this way, the reason why God will allow those certain things to happen in your life is because he can trust you with it. That may change your perspective to know that almighty God is trusting you with something that he can't trust with someone else. That should make you feel like, uh, my goodness gracious, okay, God, I'm, I'm all right with that. Um, nobody ever wants to experience pain. Nobody ever wants to experience difficulties. You know, nobody wants to, you know, be, uh, feel discomfort. No. However, God is saying, I'm allowing this so somebody else can benefit from it. I'm allowing this because I trust you. Going back to Second Kings again, when we think about Naaman, when we think about the position that he had, when we think about how he had to be humble, when we think about how he spoke about the Jordan River being dirty, think about how he spoke about uh, the Abana and the Parpai, the rivers of Damascus. He said it better than all the rivers in, in, in all the rivers, all the waters of Israel. So in other words, what he was saying was there was not a place in Israel where the water was cleaner than the waters from his native land. However, that was not the way that he was directed to become clean. And so here we are, we're looking at, first of all, he had to be humble. For now, there was a sense of humility that had to set in for him. Yeah, he had to recognize that, okay, now, okay, now, I, I thought it was going to be this way, but it's not going to be that way. So I've got to humble myself. So I've got to trust what the man of God is, or I should say, has said to me. I've got to believe that uh, I came all the way here because um, the young girl who, who serves my wife uh, shared with me that this was a person who could do it. And even when I came to his doorsteps, Although he did not come out to greet me, he didn't come out to meet me, he did give me a word. He did give me clear, uh, specific instructions on what I needed to do. And what I did with those instructions is I failed to obey them because they were, did not line up with what I thought that they should be. So, okay, so here's Naaman now. Naaman's going to back up and and, and say, okay, I, I, now all these different things that happened, hmm, I'm still a little bit angry, I'm still a little bit bitter, I'm still mad, I'm still in a rage. And so it says that his servant came near, and I read that, and spoke to him and said, and this is the thing, another thing, imagine that servant at that particular time, Naaman's in a rage, and his servant is like, uh, sir, I don't know, master, he probably called him master. Uh, master, can I share something with you? And name is probably, what do you have to say? I don't want to, I, I, I. But, but the servant, again, had to get Naaman to humble himself. There, now there's a servant humbling him. He got humbled by what the word of God said. Now, now the servant is humbling him. And this is what I'm saying to you right now. 
don't always think that it has to be like the fireworks going on, the glamour and the glitter and all those different things. Just sometimes just recognize that God wants to do things in our lives a, a different way. We need to begin to understand that it's, it's not about us, but it's all about God. And see, here's the key to it. Naaman still, even in spite of all of that, Naaman still wanted to get a little glory because Naaman wanted to be seen. Naaman wanted to be heard. However, uh, the man of God is saying here is just this simple. Go and dip seven times in the Jordan. And so when we go on to read that last verse here, I should say verse 14, not the last verse. Verse 14, it says, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan. And what I like, it says, according to the saying of the man of God. In other words, he did exactly what the man of God said. He didn't go and dip one time. He didn't go and dip three times. He didn't go and dip only five times, but he dipped seven times, seven times. That was required. That was the requirement in order for him to have his flesh restored. Now, you can look at it this way and and uh, prayerfully, he was already, he was humble then because he could have gotten that dirty water and said, oh, my goodness gracious, one, that's enough. This water then got all in my face and, you know, in my ears. And maybe I even tasted some of this water. I, I don't know if I can keep doing this. However, he did according to the saying of the man of God. And he dipped seven times. And what am I saying to you? Whatever specific instructions that have been given to you, abide by them. Be obedient to them. In other words, whatever that 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 whatever the, the the word was given, follow it. Follow it to the degree. Don't go when somebody says seven and only do five. Do seven, just like Naaman did. And it says, and the man of God, and he says, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Verse number 15, and he returned to the man of God, and he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, then if not, please let your servant be given two mill loads of dirt, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifices to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, May the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Arimon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Arimon. When I bow down in the temple of Arimon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. I read this here because what I want you to understand here is once Naaman was healed, he said that he now recognized that there indeed is no God except and no God on all the earth except in the land of Israel. And now he wanted to give the man of God some gifts, but the man of God again he refused it. The thing that I like here is that Naaman acts in verse number 17. He says, Then if not, Please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifices to other gods, but to the Lord. In other words, what Naaman was saying is, I want these two uh, loads of dirt that I can take back to my country. And when it's time to offer a sacrifice, I'm going to do it. And this dirt that I'm going to place someplace as a memorial. I'm going to place it, you know, someplace in my home, you know, around my home. So when it's time to offer a sacrifice, it's going to be to the Lord and not some idol in the temple. In other words, what he was saying here, he says that I go with my master. I go with the king when he goes into the temple and the king has to lean on me to bow down, which means I have to bow down. And he's saying, please forgive me when I bow down. 
However, what Naaman was saying is that, that I may have to bow down with my master, but my heart will not be in that worship. My heart will be in the worship of the Lord. And what I want you to understand from this particular account today is that we have got to be so mindful to recognize that God is who he says that he is. And if he is Lord of our lives, that means he is Lord of our lives. That means that the price that he paid for us on the cross should be sufficient. Let him be Lord. Stop saying, is that you, Lord? And start saying, I will obey. And in the event that you've been like me and some others, now is the time as this lesson title was, forgive me, Lord. You can say, forgive me, Lord. Lord, allow me this day, Lord God, to, to get right with you. Allow me this day, Lord God, to refocus. Allow me this day, Lord God, to, to as, as you're speaking to me, as you're answering prayers, for me to be sensitive to your spirit. And that's what we can do. And so together we say, Lord, forgive me. Hallelujah. Maybe today you want to ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, that you could become a member of the family of God. And the way to do that is repeat this prayer of faith with me. Father God, I come today. I come asking for forgiveness. I come asking this day, Lord God, that Jesus would come into my heart. Jesus, come in me, live in me, and live through me for the glory of God. Jesus, I thank you for coming in. I recognize your presence. I yield to your presence. I commit to your presence. I submit to your presence. Father, thank you for allowing me to be a member in your family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. For you today, again, I say I thank you for just tuning in. And my prayer is that we become more sensitive to the Spirit of God, that we are more mindful when we pray. Don't always pray expecting things to happen the way that you want them. Let God have his way until we meet next time. May God bless and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God.